Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to this month's webinar. This month's webinar is on exotic ungulates in Texas, presented by Dr. Jim Gallagher with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Today's webinar is made provided by the San Antonio Livestock Associated, and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Dr. Gallagher, with that, I'll pass it over to all righty, looks like we're there. Thank you, Clint. Good afternoon, everybody. We're glad that everybody showed up for this one. And uh, real, real glad to have this opportunity to share a little bit of our perspective on, on what uh, exotic ungulates can mean on the landscape, what they might mean to your operation and what, what impact they might have on other aspects. And you'll notice I said our perspective. Uh, you know, it's right up here, it says this is the Mason Mountain Wildlife Management Area perspective. This is not necessarily a Texas Parks and Wildlife perspective or a Region 2 perspective or anybody else's for that matter. This is based solely on, on what experience we have here at Mason Mountain. And uh, you know, as they say, your mileage may vary. So a big part of the reason we got involved in this is that we keep getting this from a lot of the landowners that we deal with. You know, I'm going to put exotics on my place. Can, can you give me some advice on which species I should use? And it, it puts us in a bit of an awkward position. Those of you who are familiar with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Mission Statement, to manage and conserve the natural and cultural resources of Texas and to provide hunting, fishing, and outdoor recreation opportunities for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations, doesn't say anything in there about exotics. And we want everybody to realize right up front, we are not in the business of promoting exotics on Texas lands. but we are in the business of providing technical guidance to landowners. And part of our goal is to help keep good land managers on the land doing a good job. So whether you're involved in agribusiness or sustainable agriculture, or whether it's just a family property that you're trying to keep going and keep it in the family, we're, we're interested in trying to help you with that. And if there are aspects of that operation that you know, they may not seem to fit our mission statement perfectly, but if they'll help keep good landowners on the land, well, then maybe we should consider that with you. Okay, so the next question is, why did the guys at Mason Mountain have anything to say about this? First of all, where are we? We're in Mason County, out here in pretty much the center of the state, although there's some folks just north of us who will argue about where the, the exact center of the state is. The property consists of about 5,300 acres, and Texas Parks and Wildlife has been operating the property since 1997. So we're, we're kind of the new guys on the block. When Texas Parks and Wildlife took over the property, there were about 14 different species of exotics here already. Uh, the previous landowner was all interested in producing and selling some uh, what are considered to be super exotic species. And uh, when he left here and decided that uh, Parks and Wildlife should take over after him, then most of those were still here. And again, it, it brings us back to that little conundrum I already mentioned, that uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife is all about natural resources and not exotic resources. The initial plan was actually to get rid of all of the exotic species on the property. And uh, after working on that process for a few years, we whittled down those 14 species to about seven. And at that point, somebody finally set up and said, wait a minute. Maybe we shouldn't get rid of all of them. If you're familiar with Texas Parks and Wildlife Past, we realized many years ago that uh, in order to make our advice to landowners more relevant, if they run livestock on their place, they'll probably give us greater credibility if we run livestock on our place. So, well, maybe that same thing extends to the use of exotic ungulates on the landscape. Uh, there are a lot of people in Texas who have them now. The number seems to be increasing at, at quite a rate. Uh, maybe folks would take our advice a little more seriously if we had exotics on at least one of our properties and knew something about how to deal with them. 
So again, that brings us back to this statement. I'm going to stock exotics. Which species should I use? Well, before we get too deep into that, we, we need to come up with some common definitions here. What are we talking about when we say exotic? Because it's a fairly broad term. It really means any plant, animal, or bird, or insect that's brought in from a, from a foreign land. The introduction can be intentional or unintentional. Some of the unintentional ones get lots and lots of notice, things like the red imported fire ant and Africanized bees that we didn't really intend to put out there. But we want to focus a little more narrowly on some of the hoofed exotics that have been brought to America. And we've got quite a rich history of doing this. We can go all the way back to 1786 when George Washington brought in English deer. That's what it said on the, the, the shipping uh, when they arrived. It said English deer. So we're not exactly sure what they were dealing with there. We had a, a fairly large example in 1890 when Austin Corbin brought in a whole bunch of different deer and sheep and bear and wild boar into New Hampshire and put them into a fenced enclosure. And back in the days when I used to spend a lot of time talking about uh, feral hog issues, I, I mentioned to folks, as you know, you put these wild boar into this enclosure in New Hampshire in 1890. Anybody have a clue as to what happened to them? Well, yeah, they escaped from the enclosure. So there, there was an early lesson there for us. Axis deer were first released in Hawaii in 1867. So that's quite a ways back. And the first real big effort in this line uh, in Texas was the release of Nilgai antelope on the King Ranch in 1930. So again, we're, we're starting back quite a ways. There's been some other modern examples, not all of them from Texas. New Mexico's had quite a rich history of releasing exotics as well. Audad sheep in the 1950s, Gemsbach, Persian ibex, Siberian ibex in 1965. One of the real game changers was the 1960s when brood stock became available from zoos. So this was a source of animals where you know you don't have to go all the way to Africa to get these things and ship them all the way across to get them here. They are already here. They are already kind of acclimated to the, the conditions of the area. But one of the first operations that really actively promoted this was, of course, the, the Y.O. Ranch here in the Texas Hill Country start in the 1960s. And they came up with a variety of different combinations. They started with different varieties of sheep and crossbred those and came up with different things and uh, were, were markedly successful at, uh, at creating a, a business opportunity out of that. And again, not only do we have a rich history of, of bringing them in, but uh, we have some more recent history at looking at what the trends might be and how many different species of hoofed exotics are in Texas and, and how many individuals of those species are out there. Uh, an early effort by Texas Parks and Wildlife in 1966 came up with about 26 different species of hoofed exotics, uh, numbering more than 30,000 individuals. This is one of those, let's get a bunch of guys together and just kind of swag it kind of deals. Uh, 1988, got a little fancier, so okay, let's survey 486 ranches. Came up with uh, 164,257 animals of 67 different species. Okay. The, the 88 report also estimated that of that 164,257, about 90,400 of them were confined and the rest were free-ranging animals. This is an important distinction to make. 1994 is about the last time Parks and Wildlife really tried to do this. Uh, greater than 70 species out there, nearly 200,000 individuals, greater than 42,000 of them are free-ranging. Uh, you know, it's really tough to get a handle on what those free-ranging ones are. So now, again, before we get too deep into this question of, you know, I'm going to do this, which species should I select? What, why are you doing this? Why do landowners contemplate including exotic hoof stock in their operations? Well, a lot of it is very simple. It, it produces additional hunting opportunity because it's not regulated like native game are. You can hunt them 12 months out of the year. There's no bag limits. It just makes life a little simpler and creates additional hunting opportunity. With greater hunting opportunity, hopefully we have greater hunting income. Uh, even if you don't want to contemplate hunting, there's the opportunity for uh, generating some additional income from photographic opportunities. Some folks think it's just really neat to you know, have folks out to the ranch and you're driving around and you see some of these things wandering around out there, that it adds an aesthetic appeal to your property. 
Some folks early on actually were trying to actively preserve a species. And scimitar horned oryx is a good example. It's a critically endangered species that no longer exists in its, in its native habitat. Um, in fact, uh, a very large percentage of what's left in the world lives in Texas. Money seems to be the bottom line for a lot of landowners. So, so that's, that's usually what we end up talking about. So here we are again. I'm going to stock exotics. Which species do you suggest I should consider? And the first thing we tell folks is we got to take care of the three C's. These are the things that, you know, if you boil it down to its simplest content, this is the stuff we really worry about. Containability, controllability, and competition. And we're going to go through each one of these in brief just to make sure everybody understands what it is we're talking about. Containability, how wild is this thing? Is, is it going to stay inside the fence if you put it in there? We're typically talking about a high fence or a game-proof fence or whatever name you want to give it. I mean, is the species destructive to fences? Are they, are they going to jump over the fences? Are they going to exploit little holes in the fences? And we can give examples of each. Uh, you know, there's things like black buck antelope that typically we tell folks, you know, you can confine these things behind a standard livestock fence because they won't jump over something that's five or six foot tall. Well, unfortunately, that's only part of the issue. They may not jump over them, but they are experts at exploiting holes in fence lines. And that's the reason we have such a large, free-ranging herd of black buck antelope in the state. People think, well, I can put them in here and they're going to stay behind this fence. And lo and behold, it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, to give you a good example, I mean, we, we are surrounded by high fence and cross fence with high fence here at Mason Mountain Wildlife Management Area. The species we have, the seven of them that I refer to, stay within those fences without any problem at all. If you go back about three years ago, we had some somebody in the neighborhood, we don't know who, some of their black buck antelope escaped. We had the occasion to see them on the county road outside our fence line a few times. And uh, I, I came up to work one day, was stopped at the gate on my way in, saw some standing in the in the county road. They started running. I saw one of them approach our high fence. And I kind of lost sight of it, but then I saw something running off inside the high fence. My first assumption was that it had startled the deer on the inside of the fence and the deer had run off. Well, lo and behold, over the next week or so, we began to notice that there were a small group of black butt antelope wandering around in one of our pastures. So the, the exotics that we had inside were not escaping, but black buck antelope were sneaking in. So they get, can they be contained? That, that's kind of a two-edged sword. Can you keep what you've got inside? Can you keep your anything approaching from the outside on the outside? Controllability, in this case, we're talking strictly about the numbers of individuals. Once you put them inside the fence and you, you've got a good enough fence to contain them, are you going to be able to, to control the numbers that are out there? And this depends on a lot of things. How prolific is the species? A lot of what we're dealing with at Mason Mountain really isn't that terribly prolific, but we've got others like the Psyca and the Axis and some of the others that can be. Can you accurately estimate how many you actually have on the property? And if you decide that you've got more than you need, is there a way to get rid of the excess? Is there a place for them? Is there a market for them? Is there some other way to, to cut down the numbers? All of this stuff is important, and again, it kind of goes back to what we talked about with containability. How wild are these things? How elusive are they? Uh, some of these species are, are kind of nice. They like to stand out in open fields in broad daylight. It makes it easy to find them and count them. Uh, some of them are considerably more reclusive, so it makes it a little bit more difficult to get that same thing done. And that brings us to the third C, competition. And this this, again, has several components. Food habits, habitat use, reproductive potential are part of that. And some of this stuff was done early on. Um, you know, basic food habits of a lot of these species were investigated early on, and we're talking about, you know, how much of what they consumed is, is forbs versus browse versus grass. And then, uh, you know, the graphic in the lower right-hand corner there, this was an experiment that was conducted at the Kerr Wildlife Management Area in the 1970s. Started out with 10 white-tailed deer and 10 psyche deer in a 96-acre enclosure, and it, you can see very readily what happened over the course of just a few years. The white-tailed deer dwindled away to to nothing, and the psyche deer numbers continued to escalate. 
and eventually there were no white tailed deer and nothing but cycle left. So that's that's an important component of competition there. A large part of that was because of the additional diet flexibility of the cyca and their high reproductive potential. So they covered a couple of the things that we're talking about here. Again, this is some of the early stuff that was done in the 1960s. Uh, some of these common exotics that were brought in, the axis deer, the cyca deer, the fallow deer and whatnot. You know, we better start at the baseline and figure out what are these guys eating. And actually, we found out there was there was significant competition for dietary components between native wildlife and the listed species. So the the early uh, conclusion was that these guys were detrimental to native wildlife, and that was a big part of the stance at Texas Parks and Wildlife. You know, we are all about natural resources of the state, the native wildlife that already exists here. Uh, we're not proponents of exotics, so if these guys are detrimental to the natives, then you know, it's hard for us to recommend that you should have those things. As time went on and additional species were investigated, we began to learn that actually there are lots of different exotic species that have different dietary needs, and some of them are very much more like domestic cattle than they are like white-tailed deer. You know, we like to lump things to make make it easy to consider uh, and talk about. So in, in the browser category here, you know, we think of the white-tailed deer typically as a browsing animal, and we can include with that domestic goats, axis deer, psychid deer, fallow deer, the, the kudu species. And then we like to think of domestic cattle as grazers. And with them, we can group the scimitar horned oryx, the gem buck oryx, uh, sable antelope, and there are others. So, Essentially, this becomes a, a matter of an exercise in, in balancing the dietary requirements for the, the available resources. And we can even say it like this. Uh, some exotic species are a cow of a different color, at least when we're referring to their, uh, their dietary requirements and their potential impact on, on wildlife. If we can successfully run domestic cattle with wildlife, then there shouldn't be any reason why we can't successfully run something like a Gensbach oryx or a scimitar horned oryx with our native wildlife. Again, it's just a matter of keeping track of the numbers because everybody who's out there is eating something. Now, the big difference, of course, is that we can herd domestic cattle and move them from pasture to pasture. This is considerably more difficult when we're talking about exotic hoofstock. What we have found, however, is if you're familiar with the concept of, of patch burn and grazing, we can shuffle these guys around by doing small patch burns. That's something that we're doing currently at Mason Mountain. And again, we can roll the clock back to uh, about the 1980s. And uh, about that time, the Wildlife Department at, at Texas A&M, in uh, cooperation with some other folks, came up with a, uh, a handbook for extension agents around the state handy information to have on the shelf. And this is one of the things that was included in that handbook, determining carrying capacity for combinations of livestock, white-tailed deer, and exotic ungulates. And it was based on research done by several different folks. The problem with this was, you know, at one point, at one point in time, um, the Wildlife Department at Texas A&M had put this online on their server. Just before I went to work for the extension service, I think that server died and it was lost online. So some of this information is a little more difficult to get to than what it used to be. But there was some good stuff in here. And again, you know, we like to think of, of uh, beef cattle here, for example, as a grazer. And again, if we're looking at it, an herbaceous vegetation-dominated range, then yes, most of what beef cattle eat is grass, not much forb, not much browse. If you put them on a browse-dominated range, well, obviously, there's a little bit less grass available for them to eat, so the, the grass composition of their diet falls off a little bit. But they're still specializing in grass and not forbs or browse. At the other end of the scale, we have, again, the white-tailed deer that we typically think of as a browsing species. If you put them on an herbaceous-dominated range, however, notice that 60% of their diet is forbs. And browse makes up a, a fairly minor 30% of their diet. However, if you put them on a browse-dominated range, then again, the forb intake is reduced and the browse intake goes up. So very few of the species that we have listed here can be totally listed as a grazer or a browser. 
but there's some combination of the two depending on what the range conditions are. So keeping all of that in mind, again, I said that this stuff is no longer readily available online. Uh, fortunately, some folks kind of came to the rescue. Steve Nelly and some folks at the NRCS, in cooperation with some other folks, came up with a spreadsheet that does a lot of these different calculations for you. So, you know, if you know what ecological site or, or range site you have, uh, how many acres of each, we can estimate what your forage production is going to be. Uh, you know, a lot of this information, if you're if you're familiar with it, you can go to Web Soil Survey from the NRCS online and come up with a lot of this from there. Uh, if not, then there are some folks who will be happy to help you do that, whether they're from the NRCS or from Texas Parks and Wildlife or, or one of the other agencies. But again, that spreadsheet is available to do this kind of stuff. And again, we, we look at what, what types of uh, rain sites or ecological sites have you got out there on the property? How many acres of each do you have? Uh, we estimate the forage production, how much grass, how much forbs, how much browse is being produced annually. And then we can also take into account, this one's highly important, this is how efficient these animals are at actually removing this stuff from the range. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the old uh, grazing rule of thumb, take half and leave half, uh, but it's also important to realize that of, of, of the half that you're leaving, you know, only about half of that is going to be available for consumption by your your grazing animals because there's other things going on out there. We have other animals that are making use of that same resource. We get insects that are eating some of that stuff. Some of it gets trampled on and defecated on and all of that good stuff. So anyway, make a long story short, we say that only about 25% of the grass that's available out there is actually available to go into the grazing animals. Forbs, we give it a slightly higher rating, maybe 30% of them. And browse because most of it stands up above ground level. We don't have quite as much trampling and defecation to deal with. Uh, maybe 40% of that's available for consumption. So we have forage production versus available forage for consumption. And then we start getting down into the nitty gritty here. So, okay, let's take a couple of quick uh, case studies here and figure out, do we have adequate forage available for all of the animals we have out there in the range? Because everybody that's out there is eating something. Okay, so let's say we have a property with 45 head of cattle, or excuse me, 44 head of cattle, 400 white-tailed deer, 50 axis deer, 25 black buck cantaloupe, 44 domestic sheep, 57 angora goats, and 40 fallow deer. So we come up with our, our estimate of how much forage each of those is going to consume. Then we have the estimate of how much forage is actually available. We do the balance sheet. We find out, lo and behold, we've, we've got a little bit of grass left over. We've got a little bit of browse left over. But we're in the negative numbers on forage. So obviously, we didn't quite manage to balance things out. Let's go back and see if we tinker with the numbers a little bit, if we can't fix that. So again, here in the second sheet at the bottom of the page, we still have 44 head of cattle, but we've reduced our white-tailed deer herd from 400 to 133. Everybody else stays the same. Come down to the bottom of our balance sheet here. We've got slightly more grass available at the end than what we had before. We're very slightly positive, slight positive balance on the forbs, and uh, a little bit of an increase in the amount of browse that's available. So. Again, by adjusting the numbers of a single species, we were able to compensate and, and come up with a positive balance for all of our available forage down here. Nothing ran short. Is that an adequate buffer? Well, again, kind of depends on the growing conditions for the year, and we, we all know that's a, a lot of art to go along with the science. One more example, we'll take the domestic livestock out. In this case, we're starting off with 400 white-tailed deer, 80 axis deer, 50 black buck, and 40 fallow. Once again, we, we still have a negative here in the four column. So this one, we're going to juggle things a little bit more. We're going to reduce white-tailed deer from 400 to 200. We're going to increase axis from 80 to 111. The rest of them will stay the same. And lo and behold, once again, we come up with a positive balance for all of our, our forage categories. So this is the kind of thing we ask folks to keep in mind. Do these exercises, even if you don't sit down with the spreadsheet, even if you don't sit down 
with with paper and pencil and and come up with these actual numbers. Do the mental exercise to say, okay, knowing what I know about what livestock need, and knowing what I know about what these different species of wildlife need, is there adequate forage out there for the numbers I have, or do I need to start tinkering with those numbers? So, so again, your mileage may vary. This is based on our experience here at Mason Mountain Wildlife Management Area. Again, we are running a contained herd, not, not what we would consider a confined herd of exotic ungulates. They're not confined to small pens. They're not on feed. They are ranging within a, uh, a high fenced pasture. And again, there's no supplemental feed provided for them. So everybody's making do on what's out there. And again, we only have seven species currently that, that we are concerned with. Uh, if you have a different species than what we're dealing with, then uh, some of our conclusions might not apply quite as well. But just a quick example of some of the ones that we consider to be good candidates, uh, bad candidates, and maybe not so bad candidates. And again, this is the first thing we think about. You know, we're, we're assuming that they are containable, we're assuming they are controllable, and that we're worried just about the competition aspect. Uh, if we haven't already conquered those first two steps, we need to go back and take care of those first. And then in terms of dietary competition, these are some of the guys that we think of as having uh, fairly low impact on native species. There's not much dietary competition between the oryx species, whether it's Gemsbach or scimitar horned oryx, or the sable antelope, or the common water buck, uh, with our most of our uh, browsing native wildlife. All of these guys eat a diet that's very high in grass, um, you know, they do hit the forb component. They will use the browse component some, but most of the time, most of what they're getting uh, is grass. So here's here's those two examples. On the left there, we see the Gemsbach oryx. On the right, we have the scimitar horned oryx. Again, the good thing about both of them, uh, they are, or our experience anyway, has been that they are readily contained uh, inside of our standard, you know, eight foot tall game fence. Uh, in fact, our experience with the Gemsbach has been if you remove interior fences and give them more room to range, it can take them several months to get used to the idea that that fence is not there anymore. Not only do they not challenge a physical fence, but they are real big on the idea of challenging a, uh, a memory of a physical fence. So these guys are fairly easy to keep in. Uh, again, they're, they're moderately productive. They're not going to reproduce at a rate that makes it difficult to to keep up with. In this particular case, we have, you know the oryx species are kind of handy. Both males and females grow the nice headgear, makes them both uh, attractive uh, hunting animals. Uh, both, both genders have uh, trophy capability. Uh, so finding some place to to go with some of the excess is not that difficult. And again, their dietary competition is fairly low with their native wildlife. So these guys are, are kind of good all the way across the board. We haven't had any particular problems with these. Not too hard to come up with some examples of uh, species that, that most of us would consider to be, uh, I guess, kind of a problem species. The feral hog might be number one on a lot of people's list for a lot of reasons. Uh, they are highly prolific. Uh, there is severe dietary competition with some species. They are destructive defenses. They're just darn near impossible to contain. Uh, I haven't seen just an awful lot of folks yet who've had real success in controlling their numbers either. Uh, so these guys are kind of bad all the way across the board. Axis deer, again, there's the containability issue. We, we have a large free-ranging herd in the state of Texas because we have a containability issue. Again, these guys are kind of like black buck. They're really good at exploiting holes in fence lines. They like to hang out in thicker cover. It makes it difficult to figure out how many you've got. Only one gender has the, the headgear, so trophy uh, availability can be limited by that. So again, I mean, this is the kind of thing we're, we're dealing with. Can you keep them in? Can you control the numbers? Are they going to be competitive? Well, you know, axes are competitive also. So uh, kind of three strikes against each one of them. What about the not so bad? Well, on the left here, we have the sable antelope, which you might think, well, we already talked about dietary competition. That wasn't an issue. They're, they're a grazer. They're not really competing with most of our native wildlife. 
but we do have some other issues to deal with here. Uh, one of the things we learned on early on here at Mason Mountain is that you don't want adult male sable on two sides of a fence line because you will not have a fence line for very long. These guys will tear up a fence in a heartbeat if you've got an adult male on each side. Uh, another management issue here is, again, because you have a, a mature male who keeps a harem. Uh, he very actively works at running off uh, young males as they begin to mature. Um, and we found that those, those young males will flee just as far as they possibly can from the dominant male. You've got to make sure that you've got an adequate pasture size to support that idea that these these uh, immature males can go hide somewhere far enough away from the mature male that we don't have continued strife between them. Other than that, you know, if if, if the uh, the big bull is the only one around, he's not going to challenge fences real bad. He's too worried about keeping up with everybody in his little herd and running off those pesky juvenile males. Uh, so they're they're not real bad. Other than that, their productivity is not extreme. Uh, again. The male is the only one with the impressive headgear, so your uh, your trophy opportunities are a little limited by that. On the right side here, we have the greater kudu. And again, if we go back and say, okay, are they containable? Yeah, we really haven't had any problem with containing them. They're a lot like Gemsbach in that respect. If you take down interior fences, they'll stop at where the fence line used to be for quite a while there. Really respect those fence lines, whether they're still there or just a memory. Uh, they don't seem to be highly productive. Uh, once again, only the male has the impressive headgear, so I mean, if the numbers ever did get to the point where you had to do something about it, you might be limited by that. But they are a browsing species, so they do have some uh, you know, some degree of competition with native wildlife. So again, you might want to play with the numbers there, because these guys are fairly large. Each one of them is you know, probably consuming the equivalent of three or four uh, white-tailed deer on the range. So it's something else you have to throw into the hopper if you're on how many of these do I need versus how many white-tailed deer. And this is the other thing we need to consider. Uh, you know, there are other impacts that are possible out there. Uh, these exact species can host a variety of different uh, disease vectors and disease organisms. Uh, they don't always show symptoms right away uh, because they are not considered Native wildlife, they're usually handled like livestock, uh, so you get sale and movement of these animals from place to place uh, without adequate uh, quarantine uh, practices in place, and there's the potential for moving diseases around. You know, we've, we've got big disease issues going on in the state right now. Uh, this is just another opportunity for that kind of thing to come up, and it's, it's something we want landowners to be cognizant of. I mean, it's not just exotics. It could be in native wildlife, too. So it's you know, something we all have to, to deal with. And this is where we end up with it at the end of the day. Again, at Parks and Wildlife, we, we are not in the business of promoting exotic hoofstock. But we are in the business of working with landowners to help them stay on the land and doing a good job of, of management. Uh, it, it's obvious to us that you know these, these exotic animals are here. They're not going away. Uh, Texas explicitly gives landowners the right to introduce these non-native species as long as they're not on a, a noxious species list and the, the federal government prohibits their import. Uh, so they're, they're out there, they're not going away. And that means exotics are here to stay. That means you know it's, it's in our best interest to work with landowners who've got these things to say, okay, if you're going to have them, let's make sure that we, we take into consideration all of the, the management issues that come with these species and uh, do our best to help those landowners manage not only the exotics but the native wildlife that inhabits their range as well. And with that, we'll see what we've got for questions, I guess. I think so. We're going to let you all off easy. Uh, we still have some time. I would encourage anybody, if you have questions, to, to post them up. We can certainly get to them. We will take the, the time to say that we will have another webinar coming up the uh, third Thursday of October. Pollinators. A little bit different. It's also going to be presented by Parks and Wildlife. Um, 
employees. So it should be a great talk on all things pollinators. So we'll give it just a little bit of time to, to post up any questions. Dr. Gallagher, do you have anything else you wanted to, to hit on in closing? Well, again, I mean, this was a, uh, a look at a fairly limited list of, uh, of species. Uh, we are still in the process of trying to consolidate our thinking and get together with some of our parks and wildlife colleagues and, and make best use of their experience and uh, reach out to other landowners. You know, we're, we're working on uh, trying to, to come up with a survey for landowners to find out what their ex experience has been to see how it might differ from ours. Uh, and incorporate all of that into a, a pamphlet that we might be able to give to new landowners and say, you know, if you're contemplating this, here's here's what we have learned uh, in our own experience and the, and the best experience we could borrow from other landowners. So uh, those of you who already have some experience with managing these exotic exotic coast stock, um, we, we might be reaching out to you in the near future to find out what you've already learned that we haven't. Okay, we had a couple of questions. Uh, one person says that as a kudu, uh, they have have die-offs in the winter time. Do you have any thoughts on this? That's a common problem with a lot of these species. Again, that's that's one of the things that I, I probably should have explicitly mentioned. But I mean, a lot of these, uh, you know, they they all come from some other region of the world. They are not all equally adaptable to our part of the world. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, finding those that are most readily adaptable. If uh, if a free ranging situation is is not going to work out for them, you know, and if uh, you know, we know lots of landowners have got them in more of a uh, a confined situation where they live in small pens and have shelter and and supplemental food available year round. You know, they don't have those issues like we do. But we've run into the exact same thing. Uh, just about all of the, the seven species that we have now have uh, experienced die-offs at one time or another, whether it's from uh, prolonged drought or from prolonged uh, periods of cold weather. Uh, and that's, again, you know, that's an important consideration. How prolific are these guys? How fast do they bounce back after those events happen? Uh, there, there's not many of these, I mean, other than uh, you know, if you look at the ones that are free ranging in great numbers now, the axis deer and the psycho deer and the fallow deer that seem to be very, very well adapted and, and seem to do well year in and year out, they still have die offs, but it, it doesn't seem to seriously impact their populations. Um, again, I mean, it's, it's a matter of you, you either have to uh, confine them and take good care of them as if they were livestock if, you, if you're really concerned about uh, maximizing their production. Or just be aware that I mean they're they're going to be like native wildlife. They're going to have ups and downs. Okay. Uh, next question that came in: Do you have any population data on free ranging products? Again, Texas Parks and Wildlife kind of gave up on that one back in the uh, the mid 1990s. Uh, Notice that even from the 1988 survey to the 1994 survey, uh, in 88 we said, you know, there are greater than 72,000 of these things that are free ranging. Well, by 94, because they changed the survey technology, they said, well, okay, there's, there's greater than 42,000 free ranging out there. Uh, we know there's a bunch, we just really don't have a good way to get a handle on it. Uh, the folks at the Exotic Wildlife Association do a real good job of keeping track of, of how many landowners have how many different individuals of how many different species that are confined or contained, uh, but to my knowledge, they don't try to track any of the free-ranging ones either. So uh, we, we know they're out there. We know that some of them are much more abundant than others, but actually coming up with a number to put on all of them is uh, you know, it's not something we we spend a lot of time on anymore. Okay. Um, that's the last question that we have. <clears throat> oh, part of the one that just popped in. We have we managed on the premises, on the premises, each year kept the pop as this number changed. 
I've kind of gotten out of touch with that one. Uh, again, it kind of depends on, on existing conditions. Um, that was the, the premise two or three years ago. I, I really don't know if that's changed or not. Uh, you know, in highly productive areas, it, it really isn't going to get it done. But uh, if you look at the state as a whole, that's probably still a good ballpark number to work with. I would say that that's a, a good comment to uh, direct attention. I posted a post in the chat window, uh, a couple questions up that you I can our other webinars. And we've had, I think, three now on feral hogs uh, in Texas, and the most recent one was earlier this year. So if you go back onto the website, second one we're done, uh, you should be able to go back and check out that information. and. and the answer to that question is probably found with but that will go ahead and wrap up and Dr. Gallagher, I really appreciate the the time again be looking for this webinar sometime in the next week. I should have it archived if y'all'd like to go back and have the presentation again and get this information again. thanks again for the opportunity, Clint.